Well, you can be seated, and uh, while you're being seated, children, that's preschoolers up through fourth grade, you are dismissed, and Isaac is uh, right there at the back door, and uh, he will lead you away. If you have questions, you can see Isaac. He's in a kind of a blue shirt that says Ebenezer Baptist Church on it, and uh, he, will, he will direct you accordingly. If you've got your Bibles, Acts chapter number five this morning. Last week was Easter Sunday. We celebrated uh, not only what uh, Christ has done for us on the cross, but we celebrated his resurrection. And today we're going back to the book of Acts. We've been kind of meandering through or walking through kind of systematically through the book of Acts, looking at the events and people and places that are going on, all those things in the book of Acts. And, and today we're going to look at something I, I believe that's very personal. Uh, as, uh, as somebody said when they walked out of the first service this morning, they said, you should have had over the door this morning uh, a sign that said, uh, steel toes shoes are needed. So that's one of those sermons today, all right? We're going we're gonna to step on each other's toes. You know, when I preach, uh, I trust that not only is the preaching, and by the way, it's not about me, it's about him and about his word. It's stepping on our toes, but it's also stepping on my toes as well. So don't ever think that the preacher is looking down his long spiritual nose at you thinking that uh, you've got all the problems and he doesn't because trust me, just ask my wife, she'll tell you differently, all right? But since she's out of town today, you don't get the privilege of asking her. Hallelujah, all right? Acts chapter number five. An interesting uh, account in these first uh, opening verses. The church is demonstrating great generosity. They're selling things, they're sharing things. As we conclude chapter number four, a lot of things going on in the book of Acts, a lot of exciting things, although persecution is beginning to take place because the disciples were not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They weren't going to back down from preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter number five, we're introduced to this husband and wife, uh, this couple that, that encounters a, a, a very difficult uh, experience in their life because of their unwillingness to be obedient. So let's read. But a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. They kept back part of the price. And his wife, being privy to it, she, she understood what was going on and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back a part of the price of the land? While it remained, was it not yours? And after it was sold... Was it not in your power? Why, why did you conceive this thing in your heart? Thou hast not lied to men, but you've lied to God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down, gave up the ghost, and great fear came upon all them that heard those things. I reminded the, uh, the first service this morning, don't worry, you know, we, uh, we, we weren't uh, watching and uh, as you gave this morning, and we're not going to confront you, and hopefully no one falls down dead after the offering, all right? But uh, you, you can deal with that however you want to. And, uh, and the young men arose and wound him up, carried him out, and buried him. Pretty stark story, you know, when you come to and you read the story. And it was about the space of three hours. His wife came, knowing, uh, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, ask the same questions, the very same questions. And uh, then Peter said to her, how is it in verse number nine that you have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried your husband is at the door, and they're going to carry you out likewise. Then she fell down straightway at his feet, yielded up the ghost, and the young men came in and found her dead, carried her out, and buried her next to her husband. Well, that's an encouraging story, isn't it, this morning? But there's a great lesson to be learned. A great lesson to be learned. And the Bible says in verse 11, And great fear came upon all the church, and as many as heard these things, and by the hands of the apostles were signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all together in one accord at Solomon's porch, and the rest did not dare join themselves to them, but the people magnified them, and the believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes, both of men and women. Father, I pray that you would take your word this morning, use it for your glory, teach us today, Father, what we need to learn as a principle from your word. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. I want you to hear a description of this text that was written by uh, Richard Strauss. He says they were, they, were a large, they were part of a larger unit of the body of Christ. They were part of the household of faith, the, the household of God. They, they lived in, in days of the church's greatest purity and power, speaking of Ananias and Sapphira. Consider, first of all, the state of the church during this exciting apostolic era. 
And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. They had all things in common. Now, this is most amazing. The number of believers, he says, was probably at, at least 5,000, maybe more. And yet they were of one heart and of one soul. The heart is sometimes used in Scripture to refer to a wider sense uh, to the immaterial part of man's being, including both his spirit and his soul. But distinguished from the soul as it is here, it would probably refer just to his spirit, the innermost facet of man's makeup, the center of his being to which God reveals himself and in which God dwells. Those early Christians sense a spiritual bond at the deepest level of their lives. Their spirits were knit together in the cords of Christ's life and in Christ's love. They knew they belonged to each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. That was the attitude of this early church. But Scripture goes on to say that they were of one soul as well. And that is entirely something very different. The soul is the conscious life force in man, his personality, consisting of the mind, the emotions, and the will. This is the level on which he thinks his thoughts, senses his feelings, and makes his choices. This is the realm of experience. Those early Christians were not only one because of their position in Christ, but they were one in experience also. They thought alike. They had deep feelings one for another. They made decisions that reflected their mutual care and concern. Uh, here's maybe a toe-stepping statement. They did not sit through their worship service, then go home and forget about their brothers and sisters in Christ. Maybe a lesson to be learned just in that statement alone in the modern day church. Since their congregation was so very large when they all met together in the court of the temple, they also gathered in smaller, smaller units in homes to get to know each other, which, by the way, there's a great plug for Sunday school, all right? I've often heard, you know, uh, as Ebenezer over the years has grown uh, by the grace of God, man, you know, it's, it's big, we don't know each other, we've got two services, we don't even know who was in that, who was in that first service, was there anybody in here? Yes, there was, all right? Now, how do we get to know each other? One of the greatest ways to do that is get plugged into a Sunday school class, get involved in one of the small groups that happens, some on Sunday nights and some other times uh, during the week, but get plugged in. That's how you're going to get to know one another, and that's what was happening Right here in the early church, they were experiencing some of those same uh, difficulties as they, as they grew together as a body of believers. But their loving concern for one another went so far as to touch the wallet. So you know, all right, you know they genuinely had love for one another when it got into the wallet. Amen? Amen. Because, boy, we like to hang on what's into there. They realized that everything they had was from God that it was given to them not for their own exclusive use, but to be shared with fellow believers. The result of this unselfish spirit was great power and blessing on the entire church. The church was flourishing. But in the midst of all of that, it attracted this couple, Ananias and Sapphira. They were numbered among that powerful, caring community of believers. It's interesting to note the meaning of their names. Sapphira's name means beautiful or pleasant, the same name given to that precious stone of deep purple, the sapphire. Ananias, his name means Jehovah is gracious. And God certainly had been gracious to them, giving him a beautiful wife, and, and things were going very well in their life, their business adventures, or oh, whatever was happening, God had blessed them. But Ananias did want more. He really did. And so did Sapphira. She was obviously, as Scripture says, she was privy to the events that were taking place. They wanted more than acceptance. They wanted a claim. They wanted to be more than just members of the body. They wanted to be prominent members of the body. They wanted the praise of men. Which brings us to the problem that we find in this account and this story. The song was repopularized in 1987 by Freddie Mercury, the lead singer of the rock band 
Queen. I see some of you raising your eyebrows because you listened to Queen, you bunch of heathens. No, I'm just kidding, all right? So did I, all right? In 2004, the song was voted 360th greatest song of all times by Rolling Stones. The words and music were written by Buck Ram, who reportedly wrote the song in 20 minutes in the, in the washroom of the Flamingo Motel. The song was first recorded by a group called the Platters. Some of you remember the Platters. Lead singer was Tony Williams. Some of you older will remember. It was released in November the 3rd, 1955. It reached the number one position on both the R&B and the pop charts in 19. 19- 56. Oh, yes, I'm the great. Ricky, you win the prize, all right? Oh, yes, I'm the great pretender. Pretending I'm doing well. My need is such I pretend so much I'm lonely, but no one can tell. Oh, yes, I'm the great pretender. Adrift in a world of my own, I play the game But to my real shame, you've left me to dream all alone. The song goes on. I believe if there were a theme song that Ananias could and Sapphira could attest to, it would be this song, I'm the Great Pretender. Why? Because they were, as we would call them in the modern day vernacular, hypocrites. When you think about the word hypocrite, if I said hypocrite, you know, almost, almost immediately we begin to think of someone else. That, this because that's what we do. You know, hypocrite, oh yeah, I, yes. Uh, you know, maybe the narrative would go something like this. You know, girlfriend, that Joanne, she is such a hypocrite. Well, I'm glad you thought that too. I didn't want to say it because that would be gossiping and I wouldn't want to gossip about my friend Joanne. But the other day when I was talking to Sally about her, She thought the same thing. Oh, you've had some of those conversations, have you? You see, when it comes to to being the hypocrite, we rarely think of ourselves. Yet I would say that we don't need to point the finger, rather we need to look in the mirror. Hypocrite comes from the Greek term that literally means one who wears... A mask. The hypocrite. Hiding behind the mask. Not not wanting anyone to see what the real you is like. According to Webster, a person who pretends to have virtue, moral, or religious beliefs, principles that he or she does not actually possess, especially a person whose actions do not match their stated beliefs. Of course, we know that hypocrisy is a sin. We would would find it kind of in two forms, professing belief and acting in another manner or looking down our long spiritual noses at others when we are flawed in the same way. Abraham Lincoln was once asked, what is a hypocrite? Honest Abe, as he is known, obviously his great disdain for the hypocrite answered this way. The man who murdered both his parents and then pleaded on the grounds that he was an orphan. That's a hypocrite. We certainly know there's what we would refer to as the pathological hypocrite. Those whom Jesus addressed in Matthew chapter 23, we'll examine that in just a little bit. But I believe probably most of us are simply a hypocrite by convenience. Now let me say that again. I, I would dare say that most of us, no, I, let's, let's put it this way. I would say that all of us, at some point or another in our life, maybe even recently, have been a hypocrite by convenience. I believe in the text we get a glimpse into the hypocrite by convenience. Whether it's someone who is a pathological hypocrite or someone who is just doing it out of convenience, the result can be devastating. 
I'm sure we've all heard it said, well, I'm not going to church because all there is at church are a bunch of... Guess what? That's a true statement. That's an absolute true statement. Matter of fact, look at your neighbor and say, do you realize you have been a hypocrite? Just do that right now, all right? That, that, you'll feel better when you say that. You, you get that off your chest. You've thought it already because you thought about them when I mentioned hypocrite to begin with, all right? You just didn't want to say that. Well, if you don't want to be around hypocrites, then I would say you probably ought not go to the grocery store either. As a matter of fact, you might want to go hide from yourself. I believe we're all practical hypocrites in, in a lot of ways. How often maybe have we seen someone post something on Facebook asking, you know, oh, you know, this, this horrible thing is going on in our life, and we type in almost automatically without thinking or taking action, praying when we really never did. Oh, but it looks good on our Facebook page, right? How spiritual. Oh, wow, look at all the people that are praying. When in reality, maybe only a half or a quarter or two or three did. Or when we come to Sunday morning worship and we, you know, we worship like a wild banshee and then on Monday morning we act like a wild heathen at the office. Or when we see each other and we smile, oh, it's so good to see you. <laughs> liar, liar, pants on fire, you want to slap them. <laughs> hey, listen, we, that's, that's how we are. Let's, let's just be honest, you know. Let, let's, let's just for a moment this morning take off the mask. And realize that we are all too often in that position. Hypocrisy can become a lifestyle, but I, I believe it's a, a lip style. Why? Because hypocrisy really is nothing more than just lying. It's a form of lying. It's interesting what we find in the book of Proverbs, chapter number 6, verses 16 through 19. God has a lot to say about lying, and maybe this passage is a good description of the hypocrite in some form or another when it says this in Proverbs 6, 16 through 19, these things, six things as the Lord hate, yea, seven are abomination to him, a proud look, a lying tongue, a hand that sheds innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that are swift or running to mischief, a false witness that speaks lies, and he that sows discord among the brothers." So, so what are the behaviors or characteristics of the hypocrite? I mean, let's, let's, really, let's, really, let's really peel back the mask, all right? Just for a little while, let's peel back the mask and really expose who we might be from time to time, or better yet, to make us feel better, who that other person is like. There was a study done by the University of Southern California that said this, hypocrites their behavior typically is like this. They, they live a moral double standard. For instance, fussing at someone for cutting someone off in traffic, and then you turn around and <laughs> do the same. But I know none of us have ever done that. Or, or living a, a life of moral duplicity. The example would be the politician citing neutral views on the issue despite indisputable evidence to the contrary. Of course, we, we know all those politicians are hypocrites, don't we? And all God's people said, amen, yes, but of course we aren't. Or there's the example of moral weakness, that other behavior of the hypocrite. It's a type of cognitive disconnect when a person's belief or morals are trumped by their lack of self-control and Kind of a sad illustration or example. Now those are kind of in general the three broadest char characteristics or behaviors. So how is it you know that maybe you've got a hypocrite on your hand? Again, we'll look at these very quickly because I want to return to the text to conclude. Here, here are some warning signs you may have a hypocrite on your hands. 
Or as someone has said, well, possibly even a narcissist, if you into that world of psychology and you understand the concept of what a narcissist is all about. And when you read through these, you can't help but point to the Pharisees that Jesus speaks of in Matthew 23. Again, we'll see that in just a moment. Here's what the hypocrite does. Do as I say, not as I do. The rule always applies to others, but it does not apply to me. It's always someone else's fault. Anyone who points out my wrongdoing should be punished. They always are the perpetual victim. They're often condescending and patronizing and superior and lies and excuses. Hypocrites have excuses for everything. You'll find they spend a lot more time excusing their behavior than ever actually improving it. Instead of apologizing or admitting fault, they simply ignore reality and argue with solid evidence, which they're confronted with. They lie even when the truth would suffice. Why? Because duping others is what they do. It's only the highlight of their otherwise insufferable, boring lives. And it leads to really nothing more than pathological lying. That's the hypocrite. Warning. Be careful. I believe that's what the text is doing for us this morning. It's giving us a clear warning that we not fall into that kind of trap. And so let's make a quick trail through Scripture. Take your Bibles to the book of Isaiah, chapter number 1. There's three passages I want us to briefly look at. Isaiah, chapter number 1, because the children of Israel were over and over again warned about hypocritical behavior, and they struggled with it just like we do. In Isaiah, the first chapter, beginning, uh, we'll begin in verse number 2. Hear, O heavens, and give earth, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children. They have rebelled against me. The ox knows his owner and the donkey his master's crib, but Israel doth not know. My people, they don't even consider. Ha, ah, what a sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They've forsaken the Lord. They've provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger, and they've gone away backward. Verse 5, why should... You be stricken anymore, you will revolt, revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. He gives this physical description of a, a spiritual hypocritical problem. For the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is no soundness, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. That means sores that are unkept and oozing with pus and nastiness. That's how he's describing the spiritual condition of his people. Neither bound up, neither mollified, or, or taken care of with any kind of healing ointment. Your country is desolate, your cities are burned with fire, your land, strangers devour it with your presence, and it's desolate, is overthrown by strangers. And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in the vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Except the Lord of hosts had left us a very small remnant, we would have all been as Sodom, and we should have been like Gomorrah. Verse 11, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices? You, you get the idea? He's saying, listen, you know, you're, you're saying one thing and you're doing something else. You, did you forget who you're representing? He says, I'm really sick and tired of your hypocritical behavior and your attitudes. So what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices? He was... It was God was saying, I'm sick and tired of the fact that you just keep coming back and you keep coming back and keep coming back. I don't know about you, but I'm glad. I'm glad that God is merciful on this sorry old hypocrite. He says in verse 13, bring no more vain oblations. Your incense, your new moons, all these festivals. He says, I'm, I'm sick of it. And if you will read all the way through Isaiah chapter number 1, he, he offers some hope, but, but continually he just keeps coming back to them and saying, listen, I, I'm tired of it. I'm tired of your hypocritical behavior. Stop it. Now we go to Matthew 23. 
And probably our favorite, if you're familiar with Scripture, our favorite victims to pick on for hypocrisy. I mean, this, this is the go-to passage on hypocrisy without any question. Uh, let's, let's point our fingers at the poor old Pharisees because they sure were hypocrites. And they were, by the way, and Jesus points it out very clearly in this text in Matthew 23. The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, verse number 2. All therefore whatsoever they bid you to observe, they observe and do, but do not do after their works, for they say and they do not. In other words, they had the same attitude we talked about in one of those characteristic behaviors of a hypocrite. Do as I say, not as I do. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne. They lay them on men's shoulders, and they themselves will not move them with their own fingers. But all, the, but all their works they do for to be seen of men. You know, they do all these things in public. He describes that in verse 5 and 6 and 7. And the greetings in the marketplace, verse 7, to be called of men. Rabbi, Rabbi, oh, look at me, you hypocrite. But be not be called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ. Call a man father, verse 9, for there's only one father which is in heaven. Neither, neither, neither master, for there's only one master, that's Christ. But he that is greatest among you will be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Now here it is, verse 13. But woe unto you, you scribes and Pharisees, and he calls it what? What's the next word? Hypocrites. You shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer you them that are entering to go. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour the widows' houses. Verse 15, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you what? Hypocrites, for you compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Wow, that's strong language that Jesus is using against these Pharisees. And you keep on, you continue to read, and it's just one condemnation after another to this group of hypocrites. Verse 23, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you blind guides, verse 24. I love this illustration. You strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Verse 25, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You know, you make the outside of the cup all clean, you come to church looking good on Sunday morning in your suit, your best clothes, you're hugging people. Oh, I love you. Good to see you, brother. You too, sister. And he says, you're nothing but a hypocrite. He, that's really not true in your life. He said, rather, he, in the next verse, he says, listen, clean up the inside first. Verse 27, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like the whited sepulcher, which, by the way, if you go to the Middle East, they whitewash the sepulchers. They're, they're coffins or tombs that are really set on top of the ground. They're concrete. That's how they would bury them. And so, so that it looks good, they whitewash or they paint them so it looks all good. And what does Jesus say? But really on the inside, it's nothing more than just rotting, stinking flesh and bones. Wow pretty strong, is it not? Verse 29 again, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Now go to Revelation chapter number three, because in Revelation chapter number three, John is talking to these seven churches. Uh, some would say literal churches, some would say figurative, or some would say a combination. That's not the, the point of the message this morning, but you have this message nonetheless to the churches. And he always says at the end of these messages, hey, if you've got an ear, you need to listen and hear what I'm saying. Pay close attention to what I'm saying because it's critical that you catch this. And in chapter number three, in the last church, he talks to the church at Laodicea. The church at Laodicea was a literal physical place. It was situated in between two cities, Hierapolis and Colossae were, were, were the cities on either side of Laodicea. And uh, Hierapolis had uh, warm, uh, refreshing, healing spring waters. Colossae uh, lit, was a little bit closer, uh, farther up the mountain, and cool uh, water flowed into their city. But Laodicea was a city that, that, whose water was lukewarm and literally made people sick 
when they drank it. And that's the contextual illustration that he uses when he says this to the church at Laodicea, beginning in verse number 15. I know your works, and you're neither cold nor hot. I, I wish that you were, one or the other. So then, because you're, you're lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. That's God's attitude towards a hypocritical behavior and characteristic. And, and I realize that's to you say, wow, that's, that's pretty heavy this morning, preacher. You know, man, can, can you not say something you know, a little bit kinder and gentler today? You know, something that would you know, pick me up and tickle my ears? Well, that's just what the Bible is saying. And I believe, again, I believe from Acts chapter number 5, it's a good lesson to be learned and something that we need to pay attention to that we don't fall into that trap. Now, now here it is. Here are, here are the four things, very quickly, I want you to see this from the text. These are the four spiritual fallouts of the hypocrisy. If, we don't, if you don't catch any of the others, please catch this one. This is, this is critical. First of all, the first spiritual fallout is the fact that we deceive ourselves. We deceive ourselves. You see... Here's what had to happen in the case of Ananias and Sapphira. A Ananias, he got along with himself somewhere, and he somehow convinced himself. He listened to his own human reasoning and came to the conclusion that it was okay to do what he was about to do. That somehow, somehow he was going to get away with this, and nobody would ever figure it out, and everything was going to be okay, that I can you know, keep back part of what I had promised I was going to give, and it's all going to be good. And boy, in front of the boys, I'm going to look good. Man, look at that business guy. He sold some property. Look at all the money he gave. Ananias, give me a high five. Man, you are the man. And he convinced himself of this. This little scenario that goes on in his head, however that went. And you see, that, that's what happens with us. Before we fall into the, to the sin of hypocrisy or lying, the first thing that we do is we convince ourselves, we deceive ourselves that it's okay to just lie. And, and you can apply that to a lot of things in life. Matter of fact, what? Oh, in just a few days, we... We owe some income tax, don't we? But we'll get off that one. That's, that's too personal. All right? We'll, we'll, we're, hey, listen. Be careful. Be careful. Be careful. 1 John chapter number 1 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But He says... If we say that we have no sin, what? We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And then he says a little bit later, a verse or so later, he says, wait a minute, and, and in addition to that, we make God a liar. Wow. Oh, I'm reminded of Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things, and what? Desperately wicked. Who can even fathom how wicked our heart is in those wicked little devices that we're already trying to work out so that it works out in our, our, our favor? Now, there's other passages we don't have time to turn to. There's great verses, by the way, Isaiah 44, 20, Obadiah 1, 3. Proverbs 16, 18, and James 1, 22. You see, the spiritual fallout of hypocrisy is, first of all, that we deceive ourselves, and secondly, we deceive others. I can't help but think in this scenario, and I have no proof of this, but I think if you read the text, I think this is the way it went because Ananias was questioned first. So I can't help but think that it was, first of all, Ananias' scheme, but Sapphira was privy to it, as the text says. She was fully aware of it. So Ananias had to convince himself, and then he went to his wife. Now, honey, 
you know, I've been thinking, and we've been wanting to buy this new condo down at the beach, you know, down in the Mediterranean. And in order to make that happen, you know, we're going to sell this, we'll give some of it back, but we need to hold back just this little chunk. No big deal. It's, you know, I believe God's in it. You know, I think it's, it's really good. I, and, and we can invite the apostles to come and retreat at the condo on the Mediterranean. So what has to happen first is we deceive ourselves, and then what happens is we deceive somebody else. And we get them sucked right into the lies with us. That's what happens in these texts. You'll see 1 Peter 2, Ephesians 4, 2 Timothy 3. That's what happens. False teachers, which I believe our world is full of false teachers. Be careful. But we're also reminded to beware of the, the great deceiver. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. Be sober and be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion roaming about seeking whom he may devour. I believe in that verse keeping in good contextual um, behavior. We can add in there deceived. Because before you can be devoured, you have to first be deceived. And the enemy would love to deceive you. And then when he deceives you, he sets the trap. And he's got you. And then you're devoured. That's exactly what happened to Ananias and Sapphira. Ananias thought about it, contemplated it, and the enemy comes along right beside him and says, you know what, Ananias? You're right. You're right. Yeah, that's a good idea. Little did Ananias know what it was going to cost he and his wife. The old hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, written by Martin Luther. Luther alerts us to be on guard in that phrase. You see it. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate. On earth, you'll not find his equal anywhere. Beware. Beware. Not only do we deceive ourselves, we deceive others, but here's Here's something really disheartening. Because, because we act hypocritical, we cause the unbelieving world to mock and doubt Christianity. Romans chapter 2, just one of the verses in that text. Listen. Romans 2 verse 24. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. That's what Paul says. He's quoting from Isaiah 52 in verse 5. Which, by the way, when you go out to lunch today, don't, don't be hypocritical and leave a gospel track and a dollar in it. Especially if the track has Ebenezer Baptist Church on the back. Now, if it says, you know, First Baptist in town or the Methodist Church, that's fine. No, I'm, I'm kidding, all right? Don't, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't, don't go out to the world and say, listen, this is all you're worth. But bless God, Jesus loves you. Hallelujah. No, don't do that. That's so hypocritical, and the world looks at us. I can't tell you how many times my wife, 
many, many years ago in Myrtle Beach, used to waitress, and she said, I can't tell you how many times, I know they were, you could see, you see the Christians all coming in the, after church, right? And she always said they were the worst tippers in the world. And lastly, the last spiritual fallout of our hypocrisy is this. We dishonor God and our mask of hypocrisy prevents us from being accountable, humble, and it brings discipline and potential judgment in our lives. And that was the case with Ananias and Sapphira. Now listen, I'm not saying to you today that God's going to strike you dead for hypocrisy. If that were the case, guess what? Yeah. You're right. The, the cemetery would be full and nobody would be here. Again, praise God for his grace and mercy. But don't push his buttons too far. So what do I do? What's, what's the antidote? What's the antidote to my hypocrisy? I, bless, I believe we see that very quickly in James chapter 4, and I'm done. Here's the antidote. Here it is. James 4, verses 6 through 10. But he gives more grace, wherefore he said, God resisteth the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep, and let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves, therefore, in the sight of God, and he will do what? He will lift you up. Hey, let's listen. Let's make sure that it's not our hypocrisy that elevates us. Let's make sure that it's our humility and then the hand of God that lifts us up. Would you bow your heads? Quietly stand to your feet if you would with me. I, I realize and know that that message this morning, that's a, that's a tough one very pointed, very clear. You say, man, I, preacher, I didn't see much mercy in that. Oh, let me tell you, that, that message is full of mercy. Again, let me remind you, we're all here because of God's mercy. But the greatest way to avoid living the, the hypocrite's pathological life is to avoid being like a Pharisee and come to Christ. If you've never come to Jesus, I want you to know he's here. His arms are wide open. As we talked about last week, the blood of Jesus Christ can still be applied to your life. All you've got to do is repent, come to him, and he'll save you. But if you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, maybe this morning you would just come humbly, Get on your face before God and say, oh God, help me. Because I'm going to be honest with you. I can't. There's no way. There is no way in the world that I won't do something hypocritical tomorrow unless the Spirit of God enables me and it helps me. And so maybe you would just come and find a place and just say, God, help me. In the workplace tomorrow, at the schoolhouse tomorrow, with my neighbors tomorrow, in the secret places tomorrow? God, I don't want to be a hypocrite. Help me. If that's your desire, why don't you just come and tell him? Say, God, help me. I need your help.
want you to know the psalmist said it this way. Where is my help going to come from? My help comes from the Lord. He promised to never leave us nor forsake us. He sent us that paracletos, that helper, that comfort of the Holy Spirit that's going to come alongside of us. Be that spiritual check valve when we when we begin to slip off into thoughts of hypocrisy. He waves the warning flags. Father, thank you. Thank you for listening to this message from the Ebenezer Baptist Church. If you would like other messages or just general information about the Ebenezer Baptist Church, you can connect with us again on Facebook or on the web at www.ebc1837.com.